I know, I know, it's a little too soon to announce the best amplifier of 2023. We have four months remaining in the month, but I think I'm ready. In fact, not only do I think I'm ready, I consider this amplifier to be not only a 2023 best of the year amplifier, but I also consider this amplifier to be the best of all time, one out of two amplifiers that I consider to be best of all time. And of course, when we talk about best of all time for someone, you know, Jay or Joseph or Simon, whoever it may be, right? You have to consider how, out of how many amplifiers they have experienced in a meaningful way. And to tell you the truth, I have experienced about up to this point around 300 different amplifiers in a meaningful way, right? Not just passing by or hearing it for the first time just once or anything like that. In a meaningful way, I have gone through about 300 different amplifiers. So stating the absolute obvious, this video is about my opinion based on the, you know, about 300 amplifiers that I have heard in a meaningful way. But I wanna to explain to you in this video why I chose this amplifier to be the best of all time and best of 2023 and why I can't live without it. So for some of you that know, I have traveled quite a bit this year to find hi-fi gems hidden under a rock, right? So I went to a lot of shows, I went to um, you know a lot of manufacturers, and I plan to do that more, but you know we'll, we'll see. I have a few more trips coming out um, you know, very soon. But anyways, one of the uh, shows I went to was the Florida Audio Expo. Great show, and other than just being a show, I mean, it's in Florida, right? So great food great company, everything was amazing. And there was a lot of great sounding rooms. It was one of the shows where I thought, wow, you know, despite it being a show, despite it being a hotel room, you know, there's a lot of brands that dedicated to setting things up correctly. So I covered a lot of rooms and then towards the end of the show was when I stepped into the AGD room. Now, I have no clue at this point who AGD is or what, what they provide, you know, no experience with it whatsoever, total blank. And the reason I went into this room was because I covered most of the rooms that I wanted to cover already. And then I was just wandering around and I heard this music, like this musicality coming from this room. And I know this is so cliche. I mean, you hear this story all the time from many different people, but this is exactly how it happened. I can't tell it any other way, right? So I went inside, sat down. They didn't know who I was. I just sat down and I just started listening to the system. And I think I just sat there, enjoyed the musicality for 30 minutes. And that's rare for me, like really rare for me at a show setting because you know, for some of you that have met me at shows, you know how I am. I have a camera strapped on me, it's heavy. You know, I go sit there, listen to five, 10 minutes, and then quickly write down my impressions, shoot with you know, the camera, and then I move on. 30 minutes of straight listening at a show setting, I have to really be engaged in it. And I was, this, this room was fantastic. But they had these like tiny, tiny amplifiers, right? That looked like a tube amplifier. And at this point in time, I was totally fooled. I was like, this is a really nice sounding, small, tiny amplifier. In fact, it was not until I went onto the computer to edit after I came back home that I found that, well, wait a minute. What are, what are those things inside the tube? It was not a tube amplifier. I was, I was flabbergasted, right? And some of you quickly pointed out during my coverage right? In my coverage video, some of you pointed out that it's probably no difference between tube amplifiers or solid state amplifiers. And it's all in our heads, right? But there is a small flaw in that logic and I'll tell you the reason why. So when you go to a show like this, there are so many tube amplifiers, right? There's huge, big transformer, like monolith tube amplifiers. That's way more impressive, right? So like when you look at it, you're like, holy shoot, that, that thing better sound good. So me having, you know, 
all that experience in those rooms and coming into this room with a what is perceived to be a small, tiny tube amplifier. Now we know it's not a tube amplifier, but at the time I thought it was a tube amplifier because it had that musicality, it had that flow on music, it had that kind of tube mid-range, that magic going on. And yes, I was fooled. I, I admit I was fooled. However, I don't think the reason was because it looked like a tube amplifier. Even if it was without the tube, I would still be impressed by the sound because I'll tell you right now, this room sounded better than 98% of the show. Yeah. And they were in one of those smaller rooms. So if we consider only the smaller rooms, I would have picked this room as the best of the show. And yes, I am comparing to even those rooms with gigantic tube amplifiers, full-sized amplifiers. So, and uh, we're gonna get into why these amplifiers, these tiny amplifiers can sound so good. What's their trick? So to tell you honestly, I had a lot of like tremendous amount of doubt bringing this tube amplifier, or sorry, not tube amplifier in here to check out. Because when I heard it at the show, despite the room sounding so great, I was uncertain it was the amplifiers that was contributing the most to that sound because I thought maybe it was the speakers, maybe it was the room, maybe it was the something else. Because these tiny tube amplifiers, from what I heard, powering a bookshelf speaker, it sounded powerful, it sounded deep, it sounded textured, it had that magical mid-range I always talk about. It had great sound staging, just amazing depth at a show setting with minimal acoustic treatment, if any, in that room. So I had a lot of doubts. So I hoped that it sounded even half as good when it was coming into my room, right? So I didn't have high expectations. I was hoping that what I heard at the show would at least partially transfer into my listening space. And here's the real shocker. Um, it sounds actually better than what I heard at the show. And many things that I'll, I will point out in this video are things that I, I experienced that I've never really seen another amplifier do, or at least do this well, right? So we'll talk about those things. But here's another bigger shocker. This is a class D amplifier. Yeah, you didn't see that one coming, did you? It was like a just straight on. I mean, so that was the same for me, right? So for those of you that have been watching me for a while, you know that I am not a huge fan of class D amplifiers. I appreciate it. I admit it's getting a lot better, but up to this point, I have not found a class D amplifier that I would say, you know what? That's what I'm gonna choose for my system if I close my channel down and have to pick one amplifier and one amplifier only. It would never be a class D amplifier. Just, just honestly talking about my opinions, right? My preference. But here comes the AGD audience and this is an amplifier that I would be more, more than happy to take as my main amplifiers. In fact, I'm buying an AGD amplifier. I am going to buy one. Um, now I have not decided which one yet because the audience are great, but you always, you know, you always want to see what the other ones are doing first. So I want to try the, uh, I, call, I believe they called uh, Grand Vivace, right? So that's the one I'm gonna try, the upper line one. So there's that. But here comes the audience and it totally, utterly destroys my, and shatters my world, right? my hi-fi world and what I know. Not only is it a class D amplifier that sounds better than any class D amplifier I have ever heard, but it's also the best amplifier bar none, right? Class A, class A, B, tube amplifier, it doesn't matter what it would be. This is what I consider to be the top two, right? One of two best of all time sounding amplifiers. But definitely there are very good reasons as to why this amplifier sounds so good. Firstly, inside the tube casing is this unique gallium nitride MOSFET-based power stage. 
So Gone or Gone Fet designs are becoming way more popular this year, right? So we've seen Purify modules, right? The Hypex modules before that, ICE modules. So many class D modules, and we're just kind of progressing as we speak, right? Many different modules coming up. But Gone Fet seems to be the new greatest thing. But what makes this AGD amplifier, you know, better than other Gone Fet designs? Well, for one thing, they have a patent on this specific design they call Gone Tube Technology. And so because it's patented, naturally, you can't copy it, right? So competitors cannot copy this specific design. In fact, this is not an OEM design. Not a single board is made by a third party. Everything is made in-house according to AGD, including the design work. So everything is done inside house. So the designer and the founder of AGD, his name is Alberto. And looking at his CV, which is by the way, you know, available online, um, it explains a lot how he was able to design and also patent this technology, right? Because not anyone can just do that, right? Especially without third party help. So this individual, first of all, holds 10 patents. Now that's a lot of patents, that's impressive. But what's impressive even more than that is that he has worked three decades, more than 30 years in the semiconductor business, holding top positions in many of the top semiconductor businesses. And you may even know one of them, right? International Rectifier that was acquired by Infineon. So definitely qualified, more than qualified in my books. But according to Alberto, more than anything, he is an avid audiophile who has an affinity for musicality and performance. So that's what he strives for. In fact, Alberto claims that the most unique thing that differentiates their design to other gun uh, designs in the market is that you know their right amplifiers, their gun design was specifically designed from the start to finish for audio application, while Others in the market are actually optimized for chargers and at best, AC-DC power supplies. AGD also posts many measurements on their website that backs up their claims of being one of the best, if not the best in the market currently. But Alberto is quick to point out that designs that are good on paper doesn't always translate to good sound. And so that's why he has worked intensively to make sure that the AGD units sound as good as they measure. And I have to second that. Not only does the audio audience measure well and measure state of the art, they sound state of the art, at least in my system. Another cool thing about the Gone Tube technology is that you can tube roll it, right? Definitely don't plug your KT88, normal KT88 tube into this. Definitely don't do that. But what I mean by tube rolling in this case is that they can change and upgrade your model without you having to buy a new model every single time, which kind of makes it slightly, not fully, but slightly future-proof against you know, future class D amplifier modules coming out. That's you know great this year, but it may be outdated next year. So what you're seeing here actually is the Mark III, Gone Tube Mark III, which makes the audience here the Mark III. So for those of you that are at home, maybe you have the Audion Mark II, maybe, then as of September, so as of this month, you can purchase the Mark III Gone Tube, switch it out, and now your unit is upgraded from the Mark II to the Mark III. Bam. Now, if you're asking, can this tiny little amplifier drive my speakers, my big towers, or you know, hard to drive speakers. My answer is most likely. On paper, this amplifier outputs 125 watts into eight ohms and 250 watts into four ohms. Now that may not sound like a whole lot considering that in today's day and age, we're seeing amplifiers like thousand watts, you know, class D amplifiers and whatnot. Uh, but on paper, that should be able to drive most sensible 
speakers out there. Now, to tell you the truth, uh, I paired it up with a lot of different speakers. That is what I call considered to be demanding, like the Kef LS50 metal speakers, right? And also the Bacard S400 Mark II. And I have had tremendous success. In fact, not just tremendous success in driving it because the bass, the control, is not from a tiny amplifier. It's not what you would expect from a tiny amplifier, right? And it's not just impressive. Oh, oh, look at this little thing that, you know, good job, good job. No, it's not just getting there, right? It sounds better than full-sized amplifier in terms of bass control, the grip it provides, the, the maximizing of that kind of um, control in the bass, the tightness, the extension, everything, the nuance, the texture, it's remarkable. I'll go for us to say, um, to be entirely honest, it is the best I have heard the Kef LS50 Metals and the Bacard S400 Mark II's sound in my room. Like bar none. Now it will take absolutely forever for me to go over every speaker I try the audience with because as, as you have seen in my previous videos, the audience are just sitting there, right? It's being plugged into every speaker and I played it with speakers that I reviewed before as well. So I paired it up with maybe 20 pairs of speakers at this point, right? That's a lot. So we're not gonna go over every single one, but for many of them, it sounded the best I've heard them. In fact, one of them is the Rosso Ferentino. Now, I don't, I can't explain it. It's an absolute amazing synergistic match with the Rosso Ferentino speakers. And so is it with Sonos Faber speakers, right? The tonality, the warm character, the, the slam, bass extension, the grip, the texture, the nuances, most importantly, the imaging, the depth and sound stage, the width and sound stage just explodes smooth with all the details there. It is an absolute glory because you can hear all the details without the thinness, right? You get all the details. I would say it's as detailed as any detail freak would like it. Right? There's all the nuances, all the micro details, everything is there, but it's not bright. It's not lean sounding, right? It sounds muscular. There's meat to the bone. There's meat in that mid range. There's authority. Now, another great example here is the Magnapans, right? You wouldn't expect this tiny little amplifier to drive Magnapans, especially considering how finicky Magnapan you know, speakers are. I still remember. When I was testing Magnapan speakers, some amplifiers, some integrated amplifiers and solo amplifiers even, shut down because of Magnapans, right? When I plugged into Magnapans, I remember testing different pairings when I was working at the audio store to find the right pairing. And until I found Hegel amplifiers, right? I had multiple times in my space where I'm playing too loud and the amplifier just and then it shuts down, right? A lot of safety features these days, so thank God. But this tiny little amplifier drives Magnapans, no problem, not a sweat, zero, zero sweat. And rightfully so, Alberto, guess what? Uses Magnapan 1.7 i's in his room as well, in one of his listening rooms. So there you go. Now again, not only does it sound great with variety of speakers I have tried, but like I said, it sounded their best. Like these speakers never sounded as good as with the audience before, at least to me in my room. So a lot of it, you know, if you see my past videos, you see me mention audience a lot. Now that doesn't mean that this amplifier will sound good with every speaker out there. Absolutely not. There's no amplifier that sounds good with every speaker. But when it comes to speakers that are just tad bit warm, like the Ross of Fiorentino or neutral, right? or a little bit on the analytical side, those speakers are really good match with the audience. And that's why I say, I mean, that's a large range of you know, sound profiles, right? Tad bit warm to tad bit bright or analytical. That's a large range of majority of the market. It sounds really good. Like Vocal Magical speakers will sound really good with the audience. 
uh, Rossa Fiorentino Sonos Faber speakers. Even though Sonos Faber speakers are warm, the modern Sonos Faber speakers will still sound good with the audience. I've tried it. Sounds wonderful. Even the Homage Heritage series sound good with it. But the point being here is it, it serves a very wide range of matching. Right? Most of the time when the amplifier comes in here, very rarely is it a good match with majority of the speakers, right? But the audience is an exception. It sounds good with majority of the speakers I have tried. And that's really exciting. It really makes me enjoy the speakers more. I go, wow, I wonder what it's gonna sound like when I hook it up to the audience. And you know how weird it is to go from a full-sized amplifier to something like a tiny little amplifier like this? And then, you know, it, it just has better bass control. And that's the last thing you would expect from a tiny little amplifier like this. But it explains a lot. When you look at the 30,000 per unit, right? So there's 20,000 on the main amplifier board and 10,000 on the power supply on the each one of these audience, right? Each one has 30,000 microfarad of reservoir so that it can handle those space, handle those loads, like that. So don't let the size fool you. What looks like a tiny desktop amplifier at best, th this amplifier will kick most full-size amplifiers in the S to the moon. So in terms of dynamics, if you're talking about slam, if you're talking about extension, grip, control, texture, all those base, base things, right? Just throw your preconception of tiny amplifiers and throw it out the window as far as you can because the audience will shatter your belief system. Because I mean, I always thought bigger, heavier, the better, right? Especially in that bass control you know, section. But this is a different beast. This is a, absolutely a different beast. In terms of the mid range, right? Everything I disliked about class D amplifier, the glassiness on the upper mid range, or you know, the leanness of it all, right? It's analytical, especially with purify amplifiers. Um, I find it you know, a little bit on the leaner side. You know, I always found it pretty neutral, but it wasn't as musically engaging to me. I mean, it's an absolute surprise to me that the audience measure as good as they say they do, right? Because, I mean, they sound like a tube amplifier in the mid-range, I'm telling you. To me, it has meat to the mid-range, right? It has a little bit of that smoothness and there's no harsh edge. There's no harshness. Even if there's detail that's coming at you, that's in the recording, it's not coming at you with harshness. It's coming you at you with detail. And that detail doesn't sound edgy or uh, in your face, right? It's there to give you a good tonal balance, but it's smooth. It's not aggressive on your ears whatsoever, especially because of the amount of depth in soundstage and width in soundstage it gives out, it's just a holographic, um, very wide and very deep presentation that really competes in terms of soundstaging with anything ultra high end that I have tried. Dan D'Agostino's, I mean, you know, top of the line Macintosh, top of the line, you know, Luxman, virtually anything I have tried in the ultra high end, you know, category that I listen to in my personal space, the audience do just that. The soundstage is enormous. It's crazy good in that regard. So yeah, the mid-range doesn't bother me whatsoever. In fact, with jazz, vocals, guitars, even classical music sounds good on this amplifier because again, it can put all those instruments just exactly where it needs to be and it just sounds magical. It sounds like I am like at the third row of a concert hall and it's just beautiful. It's intimate enough. It's not so far away that it feels like you're at the back of a stadium. No, it's intimate enough. Like you're in a VIP seat, you know, for the money you pay, you better be at a VIP seat. In a VIP seat, third row, just beautiful, beautiful presentation. And I'm not even a huge fan of classical music. I'll admit I use it for testing music and systems because it's such a great indication but I don't, I'm not a really good, you know, a big fan of it. You know, my grandfather used to have it as morning alert alarms. 
So you know how that is, you know how that goes, right? Morning alarm for classical music, you'll never enjoy that for the rest of your life. But anyways, I know classical music very well because of that. But yeah, even classical music sounds good with this amplifier. Even modern recordings sound good with the audience, to be honest with you, right? It obviously depends on the speaker, but the audience help, you know, with modern recordings rather than take it to a different level of brightness altogether. But that kind of confuses me too, because it all sounds really good. It aids with poor recordings as well from my you know, trial and error of trying audience with multiple different speakers. It has always seemed to help make poor recordings sound better to me, more musical, as well as modern recordings. And that confuses me because for the longest time, I've been told good measuring amplifiers are plug, go in, out the other end, nothing in between, right? And honestly speaking, that's not what that that's not what the audience sounds like to me, right? Because if it was just in and out with nothing in between, it sounds totally neutral, I honestly wouldn't be as excited because the mid-range magic is what I look for. I want musicality. This is my entertainment system. I've said this many, many times, right? This is my entertainment system. I'm not here to have a studio experience. I've had my studio experiences, right? I'm done with that. I wanna sit back, enjoy music the way I like it. And that mid-range that, that tubes, tube amplifiers give out, as you guys know, I just can't love it enough. I love that tonality, love the spaciousness, I love the beauty in the vocals, I love the musicality, the meat in the bones. Like everything I love about tube amplifiers mid-range, the audience have it. But not only does the audience have it, it has one of the best mid-ranges I have ever heard, bar none, tube amplifier or not. With way more silence in the background, with way more blackness in the background, way lower noise floor, of course, inherent to the design. And it's not overly warm or overly analytical. It's just right on, at least for me. Everything sounds good in that mid-range. Guitars, everything jazz, classical, like I said, modern music, everything that I have tested sounds good. I mean, even hell, metal sounds good. I never say this, but even metal sounds good with the audience. High frequency is not analytical whatsoever in the sense that it's not bright or tilted up, right? How many times have we you know, said as audiophiles, well, the highs are detailed, it's analytical, which kind of tells me it's gonna be forward and lean sounding, right? If it's not forward or tilted up, bright sounding, it's gonna be at least lean sounding, which means that it doesn't sound girthy, right? It sounds lean. It sounds, you know, it sounds like this. My voice will sound like this. I hate, don't, don't. I apologize for my sins. So in the sense, that the details are all there, right? It's analytical. It's analytical in the sense that you can hear every detail, but it's smooth, right? It's butterly smooth, but it's not veiled kind of smooth, right? All the information, all the little details and nuances are there, but it's not bright. You can listen to it for hours. You know, that's the thing. I love the amount of detail retrieval I am getting that I can appreciate in terms of musicality, right? The high frequency sounds sweet. It's never bright, it's never piercing. It's at no times forward sounding. Everything is in the background. Like I said, third row from the concert seat. That's where it's at. Details are there. Details are there. Just because it's not tilted up in the high frequency doesn't mean that it doesn't have detail. All the details are readily there. So honestly, this is a great sounding amplifier. Overall, it's a pretty neutral sound, right? But with a little bit of warmth in the mid-range, especially with great dynamics, great high frequency detail retrieval with smoothness so that you don't get ear fatigued. And I would say it just sounds to me, like my reel-to-reel. -reel. If my Techniques reel-to-reel -reel deck was made into an amplifier, this would be it. It sounds analog. I hate that word. It sounds analog. It sounds so pure 
yet musical and spacious, smooth. You get the point. It sounds just absolutely amazing. I absolutely love it. And like I said, it is one of two of the best amplifiers of all times for me. But what's the other one then, right? One of two. The other, I'll give you a spoiler. The other one is the NAT monoblocks. It's 10 times the size of the AGD. And it's actually MSRP, 30,000 US dollars. And you've seen it in my videos a lot because I love that thing or I wouldn't have it sticking around this long. But AGD for the fraction of price is right up there, right? It's right up there. If you had me in a corner and asked me AGD or NAT, I'll just probably click that um, record button and finish the video. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do because I cannot decide between the two whatsoever. I'll have both. But if I must choose and speaker is a wild card, then I will choose the AGD because AGD is a better match with variety of speakers, at least in my books, in my experience. Not to mention that it's a lot more friendly for my wallet. So listen, that's pretty much it for me. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it was not too long and I hope it was informative. And so if you like this video, please click that like button on this video. It helps my channel out greatly and it doesn't cost you anything. And make sure to subscribe for future audio videos just like this. And I'll see you guys on my next journey. Until next time.